Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Creative Leadership Podcast. My name is Arne van Oostrom and this is my show. Today I speak to Jan-Erik Baars. He's a professor at the Luzern University of Applied Science and Arts. He's a professor in design management. And uh, he's also an author of a really cool book uh, called Leading Design. Um, it's quite, it's very beautiful. It's beautifully uh, designed. And it's uh, it's quite profound. So I, I do recommend it. It's um, available on Amazon. So we talk about, obviously, his theories, um, his experience, um, specifically his experience uh, at working uh, at Philips Design for a very, very long time. Um, So we talk about Philips, um, we talk about um, life and how he felt sort of an outsider, as many of my guests on this show. The reason why I started this podcast is because I'm writing a book about leadership, creative leadership, and um, these interviews are are part of the research, and um, I'm looking for patterns, I'm looking for patterns in the content in the conversations and what people share about their life and how they became who they are their origin story if you will um so one of the patterns that i've uh, found uh, is is really that a lot of creative people um feel that they are sort of part of different bubbles or always feel a little bit outside of the bubble. Um, so, I, you know, I sort of started thinking about a title of my book and I first I thought, well, um, it's, it's something to do with time traveling because, you know, it's about how time and the things you experience kind of influence you and, and, and shape you. Um, but now I came to the conclusion that actually the um, title of the book should be The Space In Between. So... So there you have it. Um, That's going to be the title of my book. That's not really big news uh, because there is no book yet. I still have to write it. But people like Jan Erik um, influence me um, with their thinking and their stories. Um, So anyway, I really enjoyed my conversation with Jan Erik. Uh, I hope you do too. So here we go. People expect that... uh they can put you in a, in a box in, in, a, in a container somehow in, in a reference model like uh, what's your profession what's your nationality what's your t- character and because we need those structures in order to make sense of the world most likely and uh, and i always have to struggle a little bit because i um well, actually, my parents are Dutch, and I, I was born in the States, but that didn't really matter much. I was three when we moved to the Netherlands, and then I was 11 when we moved on to Germany, and I then grew up in Germany. So when people ask me, so why are you, where are you from? Uh, where are you from? Then, uh, yeah, then I say, okay, well, do you have a minute? <laughs> because I don't know, to be honest. Um, I can't say I am from somewhere. Um, because I've spent too little time at a particular location to say I'm from that place. Uh, so in the Netherlands, I spent a couple of years in the north, and that still has a had a quite an impact on me because I was a, a kid, you know, growing up on the countryside. But then I moved on to Germany, which is quite different from yeah the the setting, so to say. So first of all, it's hard to say that I am uh, a Dutch or German or American or or whatever. So that already means that I, you can't put me in that sort of box. I'm a hybrid or a combination. Like when I was working, and a lot of uh, colleagues were confused, specifically the Dutch colleagues that I had when working in the Netherlands. They said, you're Dutch, but you don't behave like a Dutch person. <laughs> it's like, what are you? Who are you? How, do you? how do you behave like a Dutch well, person or not like a Dutch person? What's the difference? Yeah, well, we, we Dutch people, as you know, Arne, we... At a particular point, we we give up and say, ah, shut up, you know, behave normal, you know, cut the crap, you know. I, you are now too uh, too picky. Uh, don't go, don't go further. We know enough. Well, when you grow up in Germany and you're conditioned in 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 Germany as a, as a youngster, as a as a teen and twin, and you study also in Germany, 
that's why you continue, isn't it? Because you want to have a debate. You want to go to the details. You know, you want to, you also right. are in for a confrontation. Um, mm. So if you do that as a Dutchman, then they look at you and they say, you're odd, you know? So first of, so that's the first thing that, that you discover that, yeah, you're not part of that, let's say nationality box. And then, and then the other box that's equally uh, interesting for people is your profession, your professional background. So what are you? What are you doing? And Eric, tell me. <laughs> well, you know, initially I studied industrial design and I started as an industrial designer. But then somehow after a couple of years, I, uh, I stopped with it and I went into management, if you want to say so. I still was always part of, of design. But then I discovered that, hey, actually I'm... I'm managing and I'm and I'm designing at the same time and I'm falling as also typical, you know, we, we Dutch have this saying that you can fall between wall and the, the, the shore and ship, as we say, just a wall and ship. Mm-hmm. So I ended up doing something which I call design management, which already is a pretty telling word. It's it's design and management. So it's something, you know, doing both or something in between. Mm-hmm. So also as a profession, as a professional um occupation i'm i'm not part of a box right. even today i'm i'm uh, uh you know part of a faculty i'm working at a university in lucerne and uh, i when i went there 10 years ago roughly i uh, started in the faculty of design and two years ago no one and a half years ago i moved to the faculty of business and neither or you know i'm i'm in both faculties, I was always considered an outsider, a different person. You know, when I was at the design faculty, right. and Eric, we, we know you're a designer, but you behave so differently. You talk about management <laughs> and you talk about things that, huh? Yeah. So I now I'm part of the business faculty and I have the same things. So, and Eric, it's interesting, you know, talking about management with you because actually you're not the typical manager. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, that's fascinating. So yeah, that's really, really interesting to hear and also because i mean it goes all the way back to your childhood when you, in your upbringing when you because of yeah. you know you you had to kind of adapt also to the different cultures all the time but at the same time hmm. being an outsider yeah it's always so so you but so moving um as a child to different locations different countries different cultures well so why, why did that happen why did your parents uh Move. Yeah, they always say that uh, you're a product of your upbringing, but also of your parents. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my children would subscribe to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that worries me too. My <laughs> yes. And uh, so so my dad, he's a scientist. And, um, and as such, also uh, a particular type of, of person, I would say so. An outsider, maybe, because he grew up in in the Netherlands, in in the middle of the Netherlands, in the Betuwe, which is a actually also as a region, you know, stuck between the north and the south. You know, it's <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you're on this little island surrounded by uh, rivers. And anyway, so he he decided to become an astronomer, which is astonishing, considering that he was this kid from a little village, mm. and. Uh, and that also meant that his perspective was quite somewhere else than, you know, being being in that village and, and following uh, a normal uh, yeah, career, which you would take when you're on a village. His father, my granddad, he was a um, civil servant, um, you know, running the town. He was the, the, you know, the, I said it, the head of the administration there. And actually, my grandfather hoped that my dad would become a priest. Because he was very religious, <laughs> I know. So my father said, "Okay, I yes. can take care of that. I will look for some spiritual things." But then he he picked up a radio telescope. <laughs> Slightly he different. Took it too a... literally. <laughs> yeah, too, too literally. Yeah, I was searching for. Yeah. Him. So that and 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 my mother, she's a she actually she's an artist. She she is the one. She actually wanted to become an artist, but she wasn't allowed to, uh, because in those days, you know when. In the early fifties, when you you were into drawing and a creativity and so forth, but being a girl from a you know bourgeois family, yeah, you you become a teacher. Right. So that's what she did. But eventually, she was always she always had um, 
paint on their fingers, so to say. Uh. And uh, so my dad was kind of looking for interesting jobs. And that's how you come around as a scientist. You know, you're, you're not living in a country, you're living in a community, in a science mm. community. So he went to the States and he went to Germany and well, also elsewhere. And then at a the particular moment, we, we as a family said, okay, we had enough. <laughs> you go travel. And, uh, and that's what he did. And we then stayed in Germany. We didn't move on because the next stop was Spain. And uh, we didn't do that because we thought that we would like to just finish school for a uh, Right, because you moved, uh, when you moved to the States, uh, you as a family moved with him. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. And, yeah. I will, and I was born there because of him being in, in the early 60s, he moved there, which is... Yeah, and yeah, where, what, what where, where in the state, states was that? Uh, you wouldn't guess. <laughs> How probably In not. West Virginia. Oh, West Virginia, wow. So I was born in West Virginia. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a hillbilly <laughs> boy. You know? Yeah, and <laughs> so of all places, I've been back once, checking out that place, and Jesus, well, that's that's quite something different and then, then i moved to the north of the netherlands which is equally remote because yeah. these telescopes they, they build them in remote locations because oh of the right you know? oh of course yeah, yeah because of the light <laughs> you know yeah right yeah There's radiation no radio waves so uh, far away from civilization as possibly uh, right yeah yeah of course be. yeah yeah right so they so oh that's that's interesting so as as yeah yeah, yeah. so you all he always would move to somewhere remote yes because that's where he could <laughs> do his work okay, yeah and then that, that means that you are in a family setting which yeah. is actually not looking for settling down or lo don't looking for a, a local place to be it's it, it, in my family it was always you know you're following your purpose or you're looking for meaning in what you do and then you end up somewhere where you need a house and shelter whatever but it mm -hmm. was the, the the content of what you're doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 growing up in that setting yeah i always try to mingle in with the locals trying to speak the local dialect and stuff like that mm -hmm. but always it was always clear no i will never end up here and i will right. i will just also do my yeah. thing yeah and what about school? Did you do well at school? Because uh, I mean, especially mm. when you're when you're traveling and you're going to different uh, you know, countries, different languages, different mm. different systems. Uh, was that something that you managed? Yeah, I think. I mean, going from the Netherlands to Germany, of course, is actually culturally it's huge. I think it's may way more different than a lot of people think. And you could also move to finland or to russia i think it, it's that different but language wise it's actually quite easy it's, mm -hmm. it's it's quite close i mean german language is 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 more refined and, and more difficult i think to grasp and so forth but and that took me a couple of months to get <laughs> so my dad was quite straightforward he just put me into school which right. happened to be a gymnasium he said well you're a smart kid so poof, you know get over with it so I remember going there and sitting in class, don't understand, didn't understand anything of what the teacher said. And I was, you know, sitting in the back together with another kid. He came from Russia. He was German. Actually, he spoke a bit of German, but also he had to get into the, yeah, the, the rhythm, so to say. And then after a couple of months, I was okay. And then basically it took me a year to really be able to write it properly. And then um, the the teacher said, you know what? Maybe you should repeat the class to to really get in, yeah, so in into the rhythm not, a bit better. The second time you understand what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was I was oh. really upset with that because I, I I thought it was unfair because I I worked hard to get the language, um, yeah, uh, up yeah, to course. okay levels. I thought it was unfair, and I really but okay. I I repeated the. Uh, the the class and after that it was super easy school because you know yeah. i was a year ahead yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i uh, i could really coast uh, quite easily through my gymnasium time and and uh, okay. learning and, and doing that school stuff was actually always quite easy for me and then funny enough i uh, um, there's something in me in me which is a bit competitive i don't know where that comes from because it's not within my parents at least not so obvious so when uh, so I was in a, a quite avid soccer player, a footballer, uh, like uh, you know when I was in the Netherlands, and 
And then I grew up and I grew too fast when I was like 14 years old and I became all bones. <laughs> it was really dreadful. Really? And then I turned to cycling. And um, and that that whole cycling thing, because my, my, my family was so not into sports, it was like absolutely, I mean, physical, the physical body was not of any interest. It was all about either arts, painting, creativity, or science, thinking hard and deep and trying to understand, you know, the, the universe, you know. <laughs> and then mm. and I thought, like, I need to do something totally different. So I bought myself a racing bike when I was 15 or 16. Also, because um, doctors said you need to do something with your ligaments and, and, and you need more muscles because you're all bones and it doesn't work. And then I started to cycle every day. And I went into a cycle club and I started to pick up racing when I was 18 years old. And I almost became a professional cyclist. So I, I spent years actually cycling every day, <laughs> which was really? spiritual. It was completely, you know, uh, the contrary of what I was surrounded and um, going into races on the weekend. And I was mildly successful. I was able to go through the amateur ranks up to the highest amateur rank and also winning races wow. and being really totally sucked into a culture, which was, it turned out not to be my culture because it, it's, I, I stopped with it when I picked up my studies and, but it opened a world to me, which was so different from, from where I, what I, where I grew up in that mm -hmm. even today, um, it has influence on me somehow. Uh -huh. Do you know what kind of influence? Well, it's it's like you you realize that um, you're always uh, living in a sort of bubble. Hmm. You surround yeah. yourself with mm -hmm. things, and it's it's your upbringing. It's maybe the location you're in. Mm -hmm. It's also the setting you're in, and then and then you and if you if you transfers to another bubble it's like it's like a totally new thing opening up and ever since i uh i'm i'm interesting into these bubbles to a certain degree i go in there like management is now the bubble that i go into mm -hmm. i'm not really part of it i realize so even when i was in in cycling when i was very competitive um i always was considered a bit of an outsider a bit of a weirdo um, yeah because yes. you know Cycling is a very simple sport, believe me. It's not about, you know, metaphysics yeah. and uh, the meaning of life. It's like <laughs> sweating and swearing and yeah, yeah, and competing, you know, yeah. and being nasty to each other. Yeah. And, and also deliberately hoping your competitors will, will hit that car that you just missed, you know. You hear a crash behind you and you go, okay, you think, okay, that's 10 less, you know, go, go. <laughs> it's, it's totally, totally different bubble. <laughs> and, and if you move from a design bubble where it's all about, yeah, you know, having a pen and a piece of paper and, and expressing your, your thoughts and your creativity <laughs> and designing stuff in, in how you like them to be. If you move from that bubble, then in the management bubble, where it's all about, you know, securing and, controlling and you know have making sense of the world and, and manipulating it it's again another bubble so that's maybe uh, yeah so but uh, you you are still we are still where you are you are at school you're uh, you're still at school and uh, <laughs> and you are you're doing what you yeah. had to you know after you had to kind of redo the 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 one year yeah. uh because probably the teachers noticed that they told me uh yeah, yeah. because you just didn't <laughs> grasp the language at first and now you can and so do it yeah. again and now you know but okay so and then it was quite easy um mm. so were you also were you considered then also an outsider uh, at, at, at the school or or did you more were more integrated into uh oh you know, yeah uh, i always try to blend in though mm -hmm. um yeah, that, because that's what you said, right? So you're gonna try to kind of blend in. You you know maybe even even the the, the local dialect and uh, you know you try to blend yeah. in. But at the same time, I hear you saying that you're it never really works. 
<laughs> no, because they still it, it, know. You realize, they know, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, they know. <laughs> they know. You get you get these nice quotes, like you know, from school when 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 we were done, and then we published a this magazine, the school magazine, you know, and and I always used to to do the illustrations for the school magazine, which uh -huh. already a lot of people thought very peculiar because I was known to be the cycling guy, you know, the uh -huh. competitive, yeah, sporty right. guy. That you know, I was always exempted from sports uh, classes because I was cycling, you know, and uh, so and then and then I was doing the, all the illustrations and the the graphics for the for our school newspaper, and that people thought that was very odd. It's not <laughs> like compute. There's like no, no it's like, two different things. Mm, yeah. So and then ah. and then they they and what they did to the last you know uh, version of that school paper before we were then all left school was they did this typical one where where you have a little a photo and some was some sort of description of every uh, scholar uh, you know leaving uh, uh, school and with me it said something like yeah our dutchman who always avoided to to even remote or yeah just yeah you know, who always kind of uh, avoided to to have that uh, that Dutch accent that we love so much, <laughs> you know, because I always was really, you know, into not, you know, sound like a Dutchman, though you you would pick it up if you listen closely. But I, there were times where I really was like into really, you know, blend in. But you can't, as you said, it's it's not it's not really possible. You can try. Well, I think the difference is that no, uh, you know, in the end you. Yeah, no, but I think that the big difference is that that if you the, uh, the others are not trying to blend in, hmm. you are trying to blend in. That's the difference. I mean, the others are just <laughs> it's just what it is. They're not trying to blend in. They are even even aware that there's something to blend in because it's just their culture, it's their language, it's their thing, it's their bubble. And yeah. when you're there, you're trying to blend in into the bubble. That I think it's, it's something people will pick up on because yeah, yeah. it's like you know because it's somehow. There's something else and that you're not showing because you're trying to kind of, you know, be someone else. And you know that as a human being, you pick up yeah. on it, whether it's, it's a positive or negative, it doesn't really matter. But it's like most kids at school are, are, are trying to, sure, we're all trying to blend in in some way, but in a very different way than you. We're all trying to belong to groups, you know, as kids. But it's, uh, I think it's interesting because if you are always sort of, if you've always been someone who's sort of an sort of an outsider kind of or someone who's trying to blend in or someone who's comes from another bubble or you know is a visitor mm -hmm. in your in the bubble <laughs> it's yeah. that's that's something that i think uh, is an energy that people pick up on i i, I think yeah. so what happened next so what so did you know then at that time what you that you were you know what you wanted to become and did you have a kind of an idea of what you want what your future was going to look like yeah, i mean you're scientists yeah, or arts sure. your, yeah your parents that's a good or one. sports yeah yeah that's because indeed you know you you have these things around you again you know your bubble is kind of setting the, the scene for what you would possibly become and I had I had a difficult. I mean, this this were this were like mid '80s, you know, no internet, no nothing. So what would you know about the world? You know, it's basically you know what your you know your bubble. Maybe you know some things from books or television or whatever. But in the end, you orient yourself around yeah the different options that you can see, and definitely you know physics and. Um, and science was something that had a huge yeah attraction uh you know the you know visiting my dad in his lab you know and and you know on these telescopes that they would build on on mountains or whatever it was very fascinating stuff so and also the way how they would work you know this very focused purpose-driven work where they say you know we we have to you know discover new quasars and background radiation and stuff like that wow you know it that's very tempting so i thought like yeah you know and actually i liked physics and i was good at it at school and mathematics was easy on me it was it's very logic you know and logic is simple so it's like if you're a lazy person you know math is the best that you could possibly do and I was a bit. <laughs> and, and never really, that never really worked with me, by the way. That, that's an interesting <laughs> sentence where you're a lazy person. But it's true. It is true because I had to really manage my resources because I need a lot of time for, for cycling. So yeah, I thought, like, how can I go through school with, without spending much time? So I selected mathematics and physics and all these things because actually 
if you if you practice 10 minutes per day you're done really? and okay i also took english because i i okay. the language was somewhat close to me and we and 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 i could, I could speak it um also because of my family background so i tried to to, to find the topics that were well, i think a lot of people who are listening now are like you're crazy what do you mean no. those are the worst topics they Kill me. You should talk to my daughter about maths and <laughs> well, I did. Physics. My daughter had a similar problem. When <laughs> You're she like, was what are you attending talking school. about? Yeah, she, she said, "Daddy, you know, how can you possibly say that math is so simple?" <laughs> yeah. I said, "I said it is because there's either wrong or right." Yeah, yeah. No, that's that. That is very true. Except, you know, but with me, it was always wrong. So, you know. <laughs> but then, but then, it's that's another topic because then. That's not a, that's the topic where a lot of people got influenced by mm-hmm. is that you can do a wrong right or wrong which is wrong in the first place if you're if you're at school mm-hmm. there's no wrong or right it's just you know how to no, how to exactly how no, to exactly. develop your brains and exactly. and I I got that yes quite early on in my school career yeah but you you, you but the, that, that's also because I think you have a father who's a scientist and and obviously I know by the way I have a father who's a scientist and a mother who's an artist so I, I there you go <laughs> yeah so i have some very sim i have a lot of similarities there which is really interesting i anyway so we we'll go, won't go into that right now but but the um uh but uh, but for me math i have dyslexia and 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 i think there's uh, and it also um affected my sort of ability to kind of so i lose details like little details when there is a plus mm. i change it into a minus and then i i just didn't see that i made that mistake i couldn't yep. i just didn't see it anymore and uh but i what i always was really angry at is that because i changed it to a minus by mistake just because i made a mistake with my my, my pen and it was stressed and all that mm. uh, be, but if i did that and if they would say well you changed it to minus but actually after that the calculation was right <laughs> right because yeah. actually it was yeah. because i liked i actually the first i liked math but i lost it where it was like yeah but my interpretation of so like you can't change the question right in school yeah, my interpretation of the question was this mm. uh, and I, I might have made a mistake in my I- interpretation but based on my interpretation my answer was correct give me yes. that credit you know and they're like <laughs> no no, it's supposed to be this way. Nerd, you made yeah. and so I, this, I lost this is, it. I, uh, I'm fully, and I experienced this as well, and and also at school, and and also later on with my old chin, old children, own children. Is it depends on the teacher. If you have a good teacher, he would see this and he would encourage you and say, "Well, after this, everything was fine." <laughs> yeah, and he no, would exactly. give you some points. And, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So but I, I felt very lost in that sense that that they never. Yeah, but that's, uh, I, I also maybe because the teachers weren't uh, yes. able to do so, they didn't feel that they were they they didn't have mm. the ability to do so, even yeah. if they wanted to. Because I had teachers who who were who were like good that. teachers see see this, and good teachers will will understand that mathematics is a brilliant way to train your logic and also to yes. help people to become more precise. You know, if they're a bit of you know uh, dreamy persons, and yes. mathematics is a good way to train yeah. them very carefully to become also. More yeah. attentive for, yeah, for the details. Yeah. I heard a teacher say one day, and uh, because maths is one of those, you know, topics that most kids just don't like at school. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, there's only a few who really get it. They have the brain. I think you have the brain for it. You get the logic behind it. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's easy. Right. So, OK. But but mm-hmm. but then you can wonder, why do you kind of torture all these children with math uh, <laughs> if they don't get it anyway? And he said, no, it's not about it's actually about developing a way of, you know, yes. of thinking, and is and it's it, you don't have to kind of really get all of it, but it, it does develop sort of it, it is a door. It's a door. Yeah. If you get it, there's a door to the universe to how yeah. everything works, and 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 that is so beautiful. And he said, you know, even if you get a little bit of that, that there is this thing that kind of you know it it, it tells you how everything works yeah. um and uh but but it is about it's actually i had a french uh, teacher and uh, she said the same thing is about we're not really expecting you to be able to speak in french fluently at this end but it's a different kind of system of language and 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 it will you know you know it will develop your brain uh, mm-hmm. in a different way Yes. Because it's just another system. We, you know, we think, and I never, and, and, and so they told me this way too late. 
<laughs> they should have told me mm. that earlier that that's actually that was the point i would have maybe more be more interested but uh, at that time when i was yeah. you know having all these kind of uh topics i i just hated it because i it was just like a weird game like you're you're teaching me something and now you're going to test me if i got it right and if i didn't get it right i got punished like you know wrong you know <laughs> like, yeah, yeah yeah and i didn't well, like dreadful. that yeah. but yeah. But yeah. you were at school, you're going well, and you were, you, so you were kind of, you know, you were giving all these options because of the context that you were in. And it's in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, you know what you know, uh, you have a scientist as a father, you're an artist as a mother, you're into sports, uh, but you, but, you know, there's, but at the same time, you're kind of an outsider, kind yes. of, I don't know if you're that, if that's, it was it. You know, first of all, is that something that you really were conscious of, like, I am an outsider, or? Oh, yeah, of course you yeah. are, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the not not in the sense because i was so desperately trying to uh, make sure that i could blend in you do that and if you do that if you reflect that behavior you know you're not blended in so mm -hmm. basically you have to do some sort of effort and yeah, no, 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 that was okay for me i i think i never had problems to do that effort and uh, and and try to blend in so that's not never something that bothered me or that was stressful no the, I, I i saw it as a kind of a challenge okay. Okay. where and, and generally i like challenges because of the, also that's also why i love to to compete in cycling races and yeah. it's very competitive exactly. you know yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and and but then if you 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 know your school's gonna end and then i thought okay so what's next it was clear uh, it was something with studying uh, so it was clear that I wouldn't go uh, in a factory because, <laughs> you know, you, as, mm -hmm. a, as a, in those days, you, I mean, I've been to factories and working, you know, on vacation time to make some money and stuff like that. No, mm -hmm. that's definitely not something I, I will not work to make a living. I want to, uh, yeah, to live, to work, you know, it's the other way around. So let's, let's pick up a study. So what can you study? <sighs> yeah. Good question. Uh, no clue. Um, architecture. God, I was interested in the combination of, you know, planning and designing and, and doing some things. And then, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of, um, uh, yeah, combine that with, uh, yeah, with a logic also in constructing and stuff like that. But then ah, architecture, no, that's a bit, no, it, no, that was not something that really interested me. And then my dad, he said, hey, son, you have to think of something that you can study. And it was tick, tick, tick. You know, the time was moving on, you know. And in Germany, you do this Abitur, you know, that's the, 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 your final, your closing of your school time. And, uh, and but I was, you know, oh, the season is starting soon. So I was more interested in, in getting uh, good results in, in my uh -huh. cycling. And then I was actually thinking of, you know what? maybe becoming a teacher that could be something you know my mom in the end she decided to become a teacher and then i thought you know what i'm gonna i'm going to study uh, physics and arts and become a, a teacher in both oh, oh, cool. and and a lot of people like like you said oh that's interesting that doesn't happen that often and i was looking for where can you have this combination i found out yeah in Düsseldorf and in stuttgart you can study at the at the, at the academy and also for uh, the teacher study and also combine it with with uh, physics and i got my my paper and stuff like that and i thought like okay you know if i can't th find anything else then then this could be a good thing because yeah. i also knew you know becoming a teacher i still could continue with my sports career and actually hmm, you know could yeah, be yeah. sort of a setting mm -hmm. And then one day, it was already January, so in the, my final school semester, and uh, my mother came home and he said, hey, Eric, I met this guy, you know, at a party, and he's, and we were talking about ch our children, and he said, and when I told him that you weren't really, you know, sure what to study and this and that and i told him about your interest and that you were interested in you know physics and arts at the same time and then yeah architecture wasn't really it you know he said that i should consider industrial design mm. and that was the first time i deliberately heard the word design because before that it never crossed my mind maybe i read it once but i never understood what it was and i said to my mother I remember sitting in the kitchen I said what industrial design so i wrote it down industrial design 
that sounds interesting. Well, what is it? You know, <laughs> yeah. and you can't just run over to the computer. I mean, we had computers, but they were all running some sort of odd DOS and uh, <sighs> basic and Pascal programs from my father. <laughs> no internet connection because it didn't exist then. This was like 1984 or something like that. What the fuck is that? Industrial design. So jumped on my bike because that was easy. Drove to Bonn, which was a town nearby, 15 kilometers. And you go to this job information center and with my little letter. And I said, okay, I need information on industrial design. And then this woman, you look in the, in the uh, register and you get the micro fish out and you can look, oh yeah, we have, there we have an information brochure on industrial design. <laughs> yeah. Goes into the archive, comes back with a little, <clears throat> little booklet. I still have it somewhere on industrial design, what it is, where, you, where, where there are study uh, um, options to, to study it. So I cycled back, read through this booklet and I thought like, damn, this is it. Oh, it's, about, really? it's about engineering, it's about constructing. And I love to, to build, I build models and I was like an avid plastic model builder and constructions and I did woodworking, all sorts of stuff. And it was about, yeah, constructing and designing, giving form to stuff. And then you could, and there were study options around. So that was when I discovered industrial design and then I discovered, oh, fuck, you need to hand in a portfolio. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to rush to gather all my uh, comic. I, I also love to, to create comic strips. Oh. I drew them, you know, many wow. of them. So oh, I collected yeah. all that stuff. That you still were, have them? Yeah, yeah, I still have some of the old stuff. Yeah, cool. Not worthwhile showing, but I'm a, I'm a fan in <laughs> I'm a fan in, in in comic strips. You know the the Dutch uh, comic strips. I even um, yeah, I'm a real I'm a real fan, so I collect them even. And uh, so I, I send all that stuff over. Everything I found, they said you have to show us your creative work, and I, so I put them all in a bag and sent them over to the university. Got invited for the uh, admission procedure which is a couple of days where you have to do some tests and did that. And then I was invited to, uh, to pick up that study. And that was, that was it. That was my, the first time I discovered the word design. And, um, and I started to study industrial design in Wuppertal, which was a town not that far away from where right. I was living, yeah. 100 kilometers so I can still still could continue my cycling career, which which I did in the first two years of my studies. I was basically cycling all the time, <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. and, <laughs> and, doing... I, and uh, I, which I think is amazing to to do both. Uh, yeah, both but the studying things. in those days was different than from today. Why? It Why is it different? It, you had, I mean, I don't envy the young kids. I mean, they enter into these bachelor programs, and I know I'm being a professor myself. I know what it means. I mean. It's all packed full of stuff, three years, bam, 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 you know, go, go, go. And, and in the 80s, studies was like, okay, you first settle in, you check out, you get acquainted to your new bubble, you meet your yeah, like-minded, and you go in the bar, have a beer, check it yeah. out. And then before you know, a year is gone. <laughs> yeah, you plan to maybe a vacation, you go for some work in a factory, top up your money a bit. And then you continue with your studies and then the year is gone. It's, yeah, it was a yeah. totally different way of learning about yourself, about the environment, about your bubble. And I, that's, I could combine that quite easily with cycling and, mm. and, 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 you know, and having actually a wonderful life. If I, if I look back at it, it's, I would not, I mean, I, that this were the best years of actually of my life. I think personally is mm. is growing up, becoming, yeah, strong physically, but also mentally. You know, uh, spiritually growing up, meeting my wife, which I'm, I still live with uh, today at the, at the school. Yeah, yeah, at the university, ah. she was studying something totally different, and um, cool. Uh, what's your German language is Germanistic which is, yeah. you know, for me as a Dutch person, interesting. <laughs> and, and, then, and, that, and then the moment comes where you have to prioritize, maybe where you have to make these decisions in your life where you say, okay, so what is then really the future? Mm-hmm. And then clearly um, it wasn't in cycling. Um, that was pretty obvious that for following a, uh, a sports career, a lot of other things have to suffer. You have to 
prioritize, your bubble becomes very small if you do this. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to quit with cycling quite abru abruptly and, um, and then focus on my studies and on my relationship, <laughs> which is yes. uh, uh, also very also interesting. Takes, takes time as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Away yeah. from the cycling, I guess. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and then I entered basically into this whole career path of of design. Right. And, uh, so that that's basically. And was it clear yeah. to you when you were at that school, like, yes, this is it? It wasn't because you could. I mean, it, it could could have been uh, a totally different experience than you expected. Yeah. But was it what you yeah. expected? It, it turned out to be like that. At yeah. first, I I I didn't I didn't have a clue to be honest. I was doing these things and I didn't know where it would lead to. Mm. actually quite deep into my studies i was like what is, is this really i am i'm not sure you know i thought industrial design it wasn't really a study it was more like of a job education to be honest i thought mm. it was very simple mm. and very crafts oriented i did a lot of model making drafting and drawing and And, and yeah, and also this sort of stuff, which was I liked it, but it was very, yeah, as I said, hand 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 handcrafts um, oriented, and the let's say the the brain part was really <laughs> not there. So I, I had to occupy myself with other stuff and maybe listening into other study fields or or just you know occupy myself with other things because. The, But then when I first came in contact with Philips, which was during my studies and did an internship there, I saw the application of design in, in, in an industrial context. And then I saw, I saw like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Right. It, so you did getting... an internship at Philips. Yes. Uh, yeah. But in Germany. No, in, in Eindhoven in the you Netherlands. You went to Eindhoven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to so the headquarters is... of Philips yeah, right. in Eindhoven. Right. So this, this is where and... you did your internship. Yep. But yeah, how did and you it, get... that was... Pop Hmm? That was my pure. I uh, was not coincidence because since I had no idea about the industry, I didn't even know what industry was. To be honest, mm -hmm. how would you know? I mean, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> end of the 80s, like yeah, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't all so clear. And then, so having a discussion also with my dad, I remember I said, you know, I would like to check design out in a in the context of a large company, you know, because I know that. I was I was checking out the agencies here in Germany and I found them to be super weird and weird super simplistic I I weird yeah because I I went to a design agency in Cologne to apply for an internship and had an interview with the guy the owner of the internship of the of the design agency and he was this typical designer person you know mm. Oh, you want to become a designer? Uh, are you really sure? I said, well, do you think that is a problem? Well, you know, to be a designer, it really means something and only a few can really make it. Ooh. I thought like, oh, so you are telling me that you are the one, one of the very few that made it, you know? <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm, oh, I'm impressed, not... <laughs> and you know, and where I come from, maybe that that's a bit my Dutch background. I'm not so quickly impressed with people, so I wasn't impressed by the guy at all. And um, purely because of the fact that he had an agency, well, so what? You know, <laughs> there are others that have that as well. And he tried to to paint this picture that design is something very special, and yet you have to be a chosen one to become a designer. But actually, <laughs> I figured out that he just wants to have slaves around him. That you yeah. know feel like to be a chosen one. Mm -hmm. So I asked him what what the duties were in the internship and what I could learn and so and and it turned out that actually he didn't want to teach. He wanted people to support him in his agency. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, no, this is. And I thought, no, this is not what I want. I want to learn. I want to have practice experience. So I figured I'm not. I wasn't sure, but I I thought that maybe in a large company. That would be different. It was just a gut feeling that I had. I, right. th I thought, like okay. in a large company, the the problems are more complex, and they're not so simplistic. Maybe the whole design phenomena is treated differently there. Because actually, I was al almost thinking of quitting design because I thought it was too simplistic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, due to the experiences I had with all these agency people, 
And so I was discussing this with my dad and said, yeah, and daddy, I'm not really satisfied. You know, I think I chose something which is interesting, but very simplistic and, you know, and so I, I said, maybe I should go to a large company. And they said, what about Philips? Oh yeah, Philips, true. We have the Philips television and we also had a Philips, uh, I think a mixer or <laughs> something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, you know what, Janerik? I have a lot of friends at Philips because when he was studying Delft, he studied uh, yeah, um, hmm. physics. A lot of his, uh, his buddies went to Philips in the 50s. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they were working at the Nod Lab, and mm. uh, you know it is at the laboratories of Philips, which by which then still were the, the biggest private-owned, uh, yeah, uh, labs uh, around. So you know what? I'll make a phone call with my old friend uh, Pete. He's working at uh, at Philips. And a week later, or two weeks, I don't know. Those days, the time was <laughs> different than today. He said, "You know, I got this." Um, contact address they have a big design department at Philips and here is the uh, the phone number so I phoned them up and he said this is me and Eric I'm working I'm living in Germany and actually I'm Dutch and I'm I'm studying industrial design in Germany and and I would love to have an internship oh this yeah yeah of course interesting well send us your resume and stuff that you have to this address so that's what I did put it all on the post and then I don't know how long that takes. Another couple of weeks later, you get a letter back. And, and uh, they said, well, we really like it. Or they, they phoned up. Exactly, because phone, f- yeah, phoned up and said, you know, if we look at your stuff. They had phones didn't... at the time. Yeah, so we had phones. Like, yeah. You have to think like, oh, yeah, right, they had phones. <laughs> Damn it, it sounds so like so ancient. ancient. So, yeah, they invited me, drove to Eindhoven. And I, at, at, at that moment, when I stepped into that, that that place it was on stripe s in eindhoven and they still had the gates you know and everything was like fort knox and and it was entering a totally it was entering a gigantic bubble Mm. a new bubble a Mm. a big bubble i've never been into before a bubble of a multinational company and they had you know designers from all over the world and they had all these drafting tables because we didn't have computers then it was all on you know drafting boards and I'm like, wow, this is a play. So, yeah, and that was when I decided to finish my studies and and de- deliberately entering a large company. I did not want to go into an agency. It was something that I I absolutely found out that 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 was not the way for me to go. I wanted to be in an environment which had larger structures, more complexity to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I entered Philips, and 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 I think that was me, you know, being safe for design, if if I can say that, because if if it wouldn't be for Philips, I would have stopped my design education, I'm pretty sure. Because right. the uh, I yeah. I needed, I I still need these kind of complexities mm-hmm. in in, in, in so what I do. So how did you get? I mean, because then after your studies, you started working for Philips. Yeah. Uh, but was it because your internship be- was yeah. was the sort of the result of your internship? Yeah, they just nailed me to the chair. <laughs> really? Yeah. They just said you're going to be yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All oh, right. That's and I, 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 my first internship I, I did, which was like a three months, you know, normal internship, uh-huh. and it was the the last. I think the word those were the last months of the golden ages at Philips. Oh, really? How can you t- tell me a little bit more about that? What, uh, for for those that know the history of Philips, mm. it was it was the last month before Centurion hit, um, the uh, or the, yeah the last year because the year after when I when I joined Centurion hit I think in 1991 that was you have to explain uh, that this, the year the next year yeah so I I did my internship in 1990. And I basically, I stayed and did, I did my final internship at Philips and then, you know, continued to be employed. Yeah, and that first internship was still in the time where Philips was, I think I didn't even know what they were doing in terms of turnover. It was like a big company full of designers. It was a time where designers ruled the company. It mm-hmm. was a time where engineers, developers, inventors, designers, we're looking at the world from this like still old perspective of we can you know create wonderful stuff and it will all make wonderful experiences whatever and that's what we're going to do 
And then somebody looked at the balance sheet and said, yeah, <laughs> nice, but we have competition coming up and it's, you know, those Japanese, ah, they do the same, but actually they do it cheaper mm -hmm. and we're not selling as much anymore. We have to watch out for the money. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I remember uh, a farewell party of one of the Philip leading Philips designers from the put who who was you know going into pension and he was this dutch yeah the highest ranked dutch designer we had bob blake you know being our our, our boss an american who was a yeah an interesting guy he was very much into design management and that was you know you know the the parties and everything they had i was like totally flabbergasted and i thought like jesus christ this this is great you know working in such circumstances with all these uh, means and stuff. They even had computers, you know, it was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then a year later, I entered, uh, Jan Timmer um, took over the company. Mm -hmm. uh, a little side note, Jan Timmer is uh, is from the same village as my dad. No way. Yeah, from they the knew each other kind of village? roughly. Jan was like a couple of years older, two years older as my dad or so. And uh, so Jan Timmer's cousin, he was the gardener of my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother always used to say when I visited her, I said, oh, yeah, you go to Philips. That's where Jan went, you know. I think he's doing very well. <laughs> I said, yeah. yes, yes, Granny. He's now becoming the CEO of Philips. And Jan Timmer was a great guy. He was a, he was a bit of a intimidating guy, but actually he had an interesting he was a typical guy from the area, from the from Linden in the Betuwe, in the center of the Netherlands. And he was still, a, he actually, he was still a designer, but he was more of a design manager, I think, because he understand that without having the, the resources that you need to run a business, you cannot design great stuff. So he had a tough job to uh, remind Philips that uh, design is great, but you also have to manage. So you have to take care of your resources and you uh, you have to balance these things out mm -hmm. and so he he launched the so-called centurion program which because it was 100 years of philips philips was found, founded in 18 1891 and we were in 1991 so and that meant ditching 20 percent of the company resources so in terms of exposure costs people Mm -hmm. And if you're hired at the same time when a lot of people, I mean, actually it mm -hmm. wasn't possible. I had to be put on a, some sort of a, a student contract for a year in order to, yeah, to be, you know, admitted to the company. So I realized, okay, so this is the trick. You have to both design and manage at the same time. You have to great, create great stuff, but also you have to take care of a business, which made sense to me. Yeah, so I didn't you, know anything you, about management. That was something I totally. But you like the complexity. Bubble. I mean, you like the uh, you know the idea of the, the, that things are more complex. It's not yeah. just about you know designing stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So okay. So so but but yeah, I can imagine that you know entering a company at that moment is also a bit like oh the atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, it must I mean you must have felt sort of the atmosphere changing. Right? Yes, because people you do. were worried about and losing their jobs, and, uh, and the, yeah, there were colleagues that 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 had that lost their jobs, and right. and the funny thing is that design was really growing in those days, and yeah. also grew afterwards very strong. I mean, when I joined, we were like 130 people, something like that, in Philips Design, 124 yeah. to be correct. Yeah, because <laughs> you joined remember. because you joined Philips Design, right? Just the Philips Design, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. which was then called. Uh, corporate Industrial Design Center, I think, CIDC or something oh, right. like that. Yeah. yeah, even I remember that. And uh, and ever since, the amount of the number of designers grew. I mean, I think in, when when I left in two thousand and nine, we were like over six hundred or something like that. But Philip shrunk, shrank quite dramatically. When I joined, it was still like 370,000 employees, and when I left, it were hundred thousand. Right. So it's like this kind of counter yeah, movement, which also is indicative of how yeah, design, I think, as a, as a function also grew in importance and, uh, and also how totally the, the business changed. So it was a bit of a 
Well, it was 20 years, almost 20 years of amazing learning and experiences. And I, I'm very thankful uh, uh, to be uh, yeah, being part of that, that whole transition. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it was interesting, but also I could also work a lot on myself. It, it was, it was, the company gave me this complexity, you know, like, okay, try this out. <laughs> and then, mm-hmm. And uh, so also after being in design and designing stuff for a couple of years, and, and I worked at the medical system area, which was also mm. per se more complex. I really loved that. Also the design tasks that were there. And then I discovered that um, I was also in for, for this whole, you know, um, putting design in a company context. So I quite quickly moved also into design management or so leading a team, leading a studio and I moved to uh, to Austria I spent seven years in Austria and Vienna to uh, to run a design team there and then you know really becoming part of the leadership team of design of Philips design in the last couple of years I spent there I was responsible for let's say a part a large part of consumer electronics as a so-called design officer and part of the management team so I really was you know yeah, building bridges, trying to improve what design could do and following this whole design management uh, path that I went into. So my, so I, I, I've, I've worked for, um, as an outsider, but I worked for uh, Philips Design hmm. uh, quite a lot. And um, after you were gone, um, but uh, uh, we, uh, one of the observations um I had was uh, so so you could someone said you know at Phillips you can pick up a, a project and he said you can pick up a ball you can run mm-hmm. with it and then you can just but at one point you can just drop it and then nobody picks it up and and but but you have the freedom to just kind of pick up any kind of thing you're interested in there's a sort of I, and so to me the observation was that there was a there's a freedom within Philips. And I so for me the my my sort of my framework is Philips Design. Mm-hmm. Within Philips Design, you can kind of do a lot of things. You've, you mm-hmm. have a lot of freedom, but at the same time, so in my experience was that when it would become all of a sudden become very important, then there was a in, sort of the way I experienced it was more of an almost American way of you know. I don't know, there was this force. All of a sudden, everybody got really nervous and mm-hmm. stressed and because there was leadership coming. And it was like, Rah! and then there was all of a sudden, everybody was really stressed and everything had to be perfect and spot on and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I, could, I was like, I always felt like I'm in this kind of roller coaster that, and, and then because I'm an outsider, because, you know, work for, from Design Thinkers Group and I would then be, you know, either I would leave the, the 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 roller coaster because the project ended or something, and I was like, blah, 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 like "Oh my god, what was that? Whoa, whoa. <laughs> that was amazing! Yeah. Like, what happened? I don't know." And like, I'm never going to do that again. And then, obviously, because it's Philips, it's an amazing company, and I love Philips Design, and I love the mm-hmm. people there, and the atmosphere, and it's great. So you go back again, and you're like, "Oh God, I'm there again," and it seems safe. Yeah. It's always like. It looks safe. Everybody's nice and relaxed, and it's great. And we're gonna do stuff. I'm gonna bring people together, and it's okay. And then, boom! Again, <laughs> hit you like, yeah. Oh, hits you in the face. yeah. No, no, I know. So is that so? That that's my 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 personal observation of working that I that I I never really got it. Like where to kind of I, I don't know. Found it really difficult to deal with. Mm. The other thing is, um, and this is something you shared with me. I remember you telling me a story that, um, um, and I, because we were talking about this and I, and I, the kind of, there's this paradox with Philips and, and design. Mm-hmm. So Philips design is amazing. They designed, you know, always, I'm so, you know, almost frustrated when you see the books of the, the kind of these uh, potential kind of uh, designs, like these mm-hmm. beautiful, like there is this, beehive they they have it they never produce it it's just for inspiration it's mm-hmm. like you should produce this stuff it's amazing <laughs> why don't you do this but mm-hmm. okay so and they have this this quality of design and the fiddle design i mean everybody's so they, these are so cool great people mm-hmm. and then you walk into a shop 
<laughs> you know, this is ba back when they were still doing all that stuff. Yeah. You go in the shop and you're going to just cheap whatever, uh, whatever, whatever shop that is with, with cheap electronics. And you find this Philips brand on stuff, plasticky yeah. stuff. And it's, this is where you, actually you told me that you experienced that as well, that you were hmm. at Philips. So how, how do you, anyway, these are two observations. What, yeah. just tell me a little bit more about I, whether it, I'm it, right it, or wrong or how you No, no, that. this is true. And it's, a, it's, a, it's also the, the, let's say the complexity or the diversity that I really loved and, and was attracted to that you had these two, obviously worlds not being able to, to merge. You had this whole world of design and yet this whole world of management. And now somehow they didn't go together very well, which which I tried to do, and and I think in some instances we Philips was able to do that, and when when it was able to do that, you could see the success coming in, also in terms of business, um, and uh, I think I'll still think that in the medical area, there are a lot of cases where you can see the, this being achieved, in consumer electronics only only here and there. And then, you know, I think Philips never uh, has been able to, to integrate these both worlds into one, let's say, way of business doing. It, it's I, when, when the old Philips was, I always called them an, an engineering and design driven company, innovation, doing new stuff. I mean, Philips invented everything, <laughs> if you want to say so. And actually, to a large extent, it's true. You know, they did invent so many things. But in the past, you could you could get, get away with you know putting just stuff on the market because you loved it and and it meant something to people. But then, if the market gets populated and other people and other companies are also able to invent stuff and 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 you know and and picking up on that, it. It, more things have to be uh, to be put in place. You also have to manage well. You have to 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 do it in a particular way that it becomes business wise sustainable. And uh, and and Philips never really was able to do that. I I think the biggest shock and also what what broke Philips to a certain extent is the arrival of shareholder value. When when I remember mm. very well when I was already living in, in Austria, it was 97. And we got this new CEO, the one that replaced Jan Timmer. And that guy was a, a shareholder value disciple. You know, he, he was hired not to run the company. He was he hired to make money. Mm. And um that that you know infused a sort of thinking in the organization which was already there but it kind of made it more like so yeah accepted to to look at the role of a business as a money machine and that's that, that those those four or five of years of you know chopping the company up and putting every function in a box and making everything overseeable controllable it was like an overreaction, if you want to say so. And I, like it's like injecting somebody with a, uh, a vaccination. Oh, there we are. We are in the top. A vaccination, <laughs> management vaccination. You know, and then mm -hmm. it kind of overreacts. It's kind of you know, it it tries to be overmanaged. And and this is maybe also what you've been observing. This kind of you say you know this kind of yeah. harshness. This kind of exactly yeah. Uh, Bam, you know well there's I, fear i mean i i noticed that there was a sense of fear and 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 at the same time it was a because of i mean dutch part of dutch culture i feel is you know opposed, you know if you compare it to german culture uh, the dutch can wing it can they go like yeah. ah something like this you know yeah, yeah. we'll just try this yeah. and then you know whereas in germany they'll go like wait we'll have to kind of really go into the details you know for yeah. days and days and days and and, yeah. and 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 which the difference is that you know you know there, there's different outcomes um, yes. um uh, but also but the paradox of having a very yeah very harsh uh culture as well i mean it, you know i had people who said if this you know you know, starting from a, a wonderful, nice project where we were exploring things and trying things and asking really good questions to Arna, if this is not going to be successful, I'm going to lose my job. Mm. Oh, 
well, now try to kind of <laughs> yeah. experiment a prototype around that one. It yeah. all, you know, in that, in, in, in one project that, that for us, it was like, and for me personally, it was like, ah, oh, I such a shame because there's so much talent and beauty, but it's the, exactly what you're saying. It's sort of this, mm. there's the design and there's the business mm. and, and there's no, there's no blending. It's not, it should be one. And, yeah, and it isn't, and um, and I think we'll get to that kind of philosophy a little bit when we talk about design being from mm. uh, also from your book, um, which I I always felt that at, yeah it's just a shame, but at the same time, so the positive thing as an outsider, mm. for, for from for looking at Phillips and the evolution of Phillips, uh, is that somehow somewhere along the line they did kind of say healthcare is going to be important. And they changed the organization uh, and changed the focus of the organization dramatically, and and it, in a way because it is, it's such it's everywhere health mm. healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and wearables and 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 you know, there's all also in, at least, and I haven't been at the meetings because <laughs> to me, my my I always, I'm always thinking because they they kind of decided that long time ago way before we you know no mortals knew <laughs> that was actually going to be an important thing and i always thought is that was that just a guess or did they know or how did they know that health health care connected health and all that 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 stuff that is so big at the moment and, and growing because it's all about you know really mm. relevant things mm. uh, how did that work so for me that was a that's a very positive uh, story as well it's about a quite at least it looks very visionary mm. that it's not about light bulbs anymore but when it, it was a time it was all about light bulbs yeah I mean, that's where they come from i mean yeah. phillips is, uh, always has been right from the beginning a startup i mean th right. these two these two guys you know the, the phillips brothers they were uh, you know teased by their father uh, when the go Dutch government had some seed money to spend. And right. that's why they said, you know, we have to pick up something new and cool in order to get that seed money. What can we do? Oh, electricity. Yeah, yeah. nobody has it. That must be something. That's the future. So that's why these two dudes from the, from the West went to the South, which was by then still underdeveloped and with some funding money from the government, they set up Philips producing light bulbs in a town where there was no electricity. So that's visionary from the beginning, in, exactly. in, but also very business oriented. I think that yeah. that always has been also somehow in the big ground, in the background. But yes, I, I think always with some sort of a visionary approach. And I always felt that when I was in Philips and I think at the same time, this also sort of opportunistic approach also is part of the company culture and also part of Dutch culture. Oh, we can do this and this and this. Let's bet on more horses than on one. You know, yeah. I remember strategy meetings and also documents where there was always health tech, but there were also others. Right. Yeah. You know, and let's see where it goes. I think the the um, you know chopping off all these parts of Philips was partly a strategy, but also I think to a, a large deal also an opportunistic approach. Right on seeing what can we cash in right now. I mean, when this, this um, Bonestra came in and, you know, brought in this whole shareholder focus, he needed cash. So right. some things were chopped off yeah. quite immediately for that purpose. And then they were, the money was put in others in order to, you know, focus. And, and, and clearly, you know, if you, if you bring in a management perspective, as opposed to more a design perspective into an organization, you're into controlling Mm -hmm. and overviewing and you know and, and 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 rationalizing what you're doing and that means that oh you oh i have this i have this i have this well actually managing all of this managing a conglomerate is complex well yeah. i would say yes why not <laughs> but if you have a management perspective then you say you know and you had others you had siemens and ge all these conglomerates at the same time making the same decisions yeah. you know i chop right. off the complexity it's too complex you can't manage it Let's build, you know, conglomerates. You 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 cannot do that, and that was almost became like a right. a rule of law. Well, now we see Samsung and Huawei and others big conglomerates mm -hmm. getting traction quite a lot, mm -hmm. 
and uh, and large companies like Apple or Microsoft becoming almost like a conglomerate again. So mm -hmm. it depends. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I think the the, the what what I discovered is uh, mm -hmm. in in Philips is and this kind of you know kept me busy also afterwards and also led me to look in the, the relationship between design and management. It was the difficulty, as you said, to to combine those two things and to to look at more to look at this more holistically. All right. Uh, and 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 also understanding that it's not either or, but it's both. And right. exactly. you know, being part of Philip's design, there was always this kind of yeah ignorance almost uh, towards business topics or management topics. And if it was, it was like overreacting, like what mm -hmm. you said. Oh, yeah. I will yeah. lose my job tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> or we will if we can't do it like this, then if we cannot squeeze our supply and we cannot, it was always yeah. very overreacting instead of yeah. embracing it and making it part of your own way of working. It was yeah. like, oh, and now I have to manage. Yeah, exactly. It was never. I could tell the difference in uh, in tone of voice and even the eye. So I, I, I still I'm yeah. seeing people in my mind now that I work with that I saw it in their eyes. Like, oh, yeah. oh, wait a minute, something happened. <laughs> something happened. What's going? On? Why are you so now stressed? we have to talk about money? Oops. Yeah, were you so stressed all of a sudden? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, Ooh. yeah. Or they had to be like a presentation to some kind of uh, whatever venture board or something, and everybody yeah. gets so stressed. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and I and I just refuse to get stressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, just, if it's no good, it's no good. What what are you talking about? But no, mm -hmm. and the speed of things. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I I uh, but you know that's 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 a complexity. That's those are the the you know the, it's also the way most companies uh, you know try to deal with that complexity and the the balance between the two. Mm -hmm. um, I so you left. Why did you leave? <sighs> Good question. Well, there were a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I did a lot in Philips. I in Philips design, um, I have to say. So, in my last job, I I had a great time working for this consumer electronics division. And together with that division, I think we I achieved some things that I set myself as a target. I wanted to also help the business to become also you know business-wise successful and and we achieved that it was a, it was a bit of a success story and it's something that i wanted to prove myself that you know you can also do this kind of hardcore business oriented design stuff and then i was also reporting directly to the to the head of the design uh, group and i knew there is nothing really what i can do after this job and I, it's like it's it, what, what we said earlier on you have these phases in your life every so often mm. you're looking for this next challenge and it's the same with me you know what yeah. can i do next right. and I, I knew for sure i will never be able to follow up my boss which i could do i think from let's say capability perspectives but not from my my setting and, and positioning perspective I, I knew for sure they will get somebody from the outside they will never you know, bring somebody up from the inside to run this place. So I know, no, career-wise, um, there's not much I can do in Philips Design. So either I move within Philips, which could be an option, go to the business, you know, pick up a job there, which some of my colleagues did in the past. And I thought like, wow, pff, you know, you know, all these businesses, this is not really something you are desiring. So actually, I wasn't active looking, actively looking for another job. But then I I, uh, I got this um, this phone call from another company um, that they were looking for somebody, an expert in design management to help them out, which was Deutsche Telekom in Germany. And that happened to be close, very close to the place where I grew up right. and where also my parents returned back to, you know, my father was running into his pension and I thought like, whoa, this could be interesting, you know, being in Bonn, you know, I know the town and the area, the, Living there is just marvelous. It's just amazing. You have the Eiffel, you have the Rhine. It's like, I thought like, yeah, it could be interesting. And also my family was kind of fed up of me, me being flying around the globe all the time. Also the traveling was a bit of a piss yeah. and try to say this. It was, you know, so I said, okay, let's do it. And then I moved and I moved to this other company. And I think after three weeks, I realized, shit, 
totally wrong decision <laughs> really why oh, how come yeah you know i mean i was warned and <laughs> if any of my friends use will listen to this podcast they will say we told you so <laughs> I, it's true a lot of my friends that knew this place and that were that were working in germany they knew that it was toxic and, but I thought, like, I'm in for a challenge. You know, I am. I am. I truly, I am. I'm in for a challenge. I thought, like, I'll, I'll test it out. So the, the head of that design team, that person was not normal. And then I thought, like, okay, that happens. I've been with people before that are not, yeah, that have some sort of an issue. You have to deal with it. And it turns out that you you simply cannot. And then I found out that the organization around her and the larger organization was just absolutely toxic and completely not what Philips was. As you said before, Philips was an open space. Mm-hmm. A lot of things didn't work there. I mean, they couldn't deal with management. They they had really issues in in interdisciplinary working. Um, uh, lots of issues, but it was an open space mm-hmm. it wasn't also to a certain degree um yeah friendly space with all the harshness that it could have yeah, all the yeah. dutchness about it it was still you know you you could say what you wanted to say and it was also supportive to a certain degree now this new space was the completely the contrary <laughs> so i basically um said okay this is it i have to quit altogether so i did a year later i quit it i um i ran away this was uh, my first the first big crisis in my life without a job uh, without an income with the kids still being in school with a mortgage with a wife you know with no real income i thought like shit so now we are going to be put to the test (laughs) and and then basically you also say, so what do I do next? And then you get all these issues coming in that are beyond what you normally have. It's uh, oh, so there is no there's no monthly pay. So I had some savings and I figured out, okay, I can sustain for two years. I'm picking up some some support money from the state. And I said, well, within two years, you should be able to find the next new thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I told to myself. I looked in the mirror. I said, "Yeah, Eric, you can do this. Within two years, you <laughs> you can find something." Knowing that I was this hyper specialist, not not I, I wasn't like a painter or a carpenter or something where you can say, "Well, you just you know," or a manager. Yeah. I was a specialist in design management. You and know, how spending many jobs having spent there? twenty-one years in. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. To be honest, it, it really it, it was very hard on. Uh, it, it was the hardest. Well, time also in my, because in my life. yeah, because also not just that you're a hyper specialist. Uh, so how many jobs are there? But yeah. you know, for for people like that. But also, is that going to be more fun? And is that going, or, or are you just going to end up in the same space? But then maybe with another company and doing yeah. the same thing. Yeah. So how do exactly. you? Because you came from Philips, which you described. I mean, I can really imagine that there are not that many companies with such an openness and yeah. such a, uh, you know, all the good things. I mean, all, every company has good and bad things. So, yeah. So how do you, where are you going to, and I can imagine that you're like, what, then what do you keep like same, but then in another company or who's going to exactly. hire you? Yeah, you know, yeah. So <laughs> and then Exactly. And that's what I thought. Like, Oh, if you now would go to these, um placement agencies and headhunters mm-hmm. and say well i'm available you know you're like f- uh, 45 years old yeah okay it might still be the age but but do you really want to go in a company you do you want to yeah. run the risk of, of going somewhere else you know maybe yeah. to the states or wherever and then you have to leave your family behind because they won't go that was quite clear uh jesus so then i said you know what there, there are two or three things that actually I always wanted to do. I wanted to do more in lecturing mm-hmm. and education because yes. I was, you know, already, already since the end of the 90s, I was doing all these sort of side jobs in, in at universities. Right. And it, I always liked it. And it was yep. always liked by the students. They always thought that I was kind of an interesting guy to be to have around in a lecturing program. 
because a lot of you know experience from the practice and also, yeah, also a lot yeah. of theoretical stuff and, and teaching wasn't something uh, you know just wasn't strange to you because exactly. first of all your you know teaching you know your mother was a teacher you 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 actually you know you thought about being a teacher at the ready yeah. to start right yeah. so it's not like yeah. it's not an odd thing for you to uh, no think no and that 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 was one one direction and the other direction mm. was okay you know what I, i i have particular knowledge that i gained i also by then already had models developed and stuff like that so let's set up a consulting business mm. for this particular issue you know supporting organizations to make better use of the competency of in design and management in in a collaboration of the two so design management so to say yeah and Well, that uh, the, the 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 lecturing uh, idea was uh, quite quickly. A couple of months later, I had a had a job. Um, it was coincidence or not? I don't know. It's hard to say if that exists. But in Lucerne, in Switzerland, they had this bachelor program. One of the very very few um, that focused on design management, and that was like an absolute fit because I'm an ex professional expert in design management. So that was ideal so i started there and then on the side i started to develop my consulting activities very slowly also realizing that there's a growing demand for these sort of support services but still not yet recognized it is changing now i think a lot of more companies realize that if you want to do something with design you better first start thinking of design management And then starting to really, you know, deploy design mm. in a, in a, in a decent way, and not the other way around. And so that that is growing, but yeah, and and, and this is already also again, you know, 10 years in the making. So, right. The uh, I did the uh, I had it uh, the design pro design management program in Lucerne for like seven years, and then I again, you know, it was seven years. So I thought like, oh, I need to do something <laughs> else. You know, been there, done that. And so I moved on in Lucerne, switched the faculties from the design faculty. I switched to the management faculty, mm -hmm. which I think is uh, yeah. is what you have to do if you're in design management. Yeah. And now I do a lot also in research. I, I investigate how organizations are, you know, dealing with competencies and how you can basically also detect their competencies in management and design in these sort of fields. So that's very, very interesting, also complex work, which, which I like. Yeah. And then on the side, I, I'm running my, uh, my design consultancy, my uh, pre-new, which I run with two colleagues, two friends, two partners. And we support organizations in exactly these topics. Yeah. Right. So, and, uh, and um, recently you, you, uh... You, you, when did you start writing your the book uh, that you published? <laughs> when when would when did that start? You know, it actually you... started when I when I quitted Philips and I moved to uh, Deutsche Telekom. Really? Already then yeah. I was writing little pieces and ah, articles. Right. Yeah. 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 Opted pieces on on all sorts of stuff. And then mm -hmm. when I when I quitted Deutsche Telekom, I needed to do something because mm -hmm. I was. I needed a therapy, to be honest. <laughs> so, right. Oh, there you go. It, I really needed therapy. I either, I could have gone to a therapist, and I, being yeah, who I am, I thought that oh, I can I can do my own therapy. So I made a therapy plan for myself, and I thought you first of all you need reflection. You need to get things off your chest. So what I did is I started to write a lot my experiences on on whatever i i encountered over the the 20 years before that so i put that all on my website a blog which is you know is filled full of of articles reflecting on these whole phenomena so design and organization management versus design but also you know societal things psychological things and i got into this writing mode you know practicing you know, uh, reflecting my experience and put them out there. And then, of course, friends said to me, you know, you, you're writing a lot and it's interesting stuff and you also have these interesting models. And now, I, and, then I became, and then I became part of the university and, you know, you, you, at a particular point, they handed, um, in Switzerland is slightly different than in other countries. After a couple of years, I was 
granted the professor uh, status. So I thought, Jesus, now you have to write your book <laughs> for many yeah. reasons. Of course. Which if you're a professor a and you don't yeah. have, yeah, if you don't have a book out, <laughs> I don't know. You, yeah, you, I don't. Not you're not. You know, not you cannot be taken for full. <laughs> so yeah, and then it, it like in 2017, I think it was over Christmas. I sat down and I wrote the whole book. Uh, just you know, locked myself in, really, wow. and, and made the structure, and 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 wrote, 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 and then and then I gave it to a lot of friends of mine and said, please, can you help me? And so I'm thankful for the feedback that I got from them. And some person said, well, you know, I like this, but I don't like the order. Or I think this should be done better. On so they kind of, um, yeah, reviewed it, and I did a couple of rounds, and then I um, and I already had some parts in other books, like you had also had, like you know, guest lecturing in other books and stuff like that. And I went, I found a publisher, Fallen, uh, publisher in Germany and uh, they liked the whole thing and also said i want to do everything so not only writing it i also want to be in control of the design so i mm -hmm. hired a designer in lucerne mm -hmm. a design agency called peng peng and they they designed the whole book yeah, which cost me a lot of money so i spent <laughs> <laughs> I can another part of my savings on that book because i thought this is how i want it and no publisher will tell me how the book should be right. so the book is really how i wanted it to be yeah and luckily the publisher liked it so the english version that you have is um one that that i made afterwards the original german yeah. book is um is was came out first in 2018 mm -hmm. and then a lot of people said you know german that's a difficult language you know please help us you know uh, can you translate it also into english so that's what i then did and then yeah. it took a while because i was very busy and, and I published it myself because I simply could not find a publisher really? um, willing to publish it because they thought it was too niche and too, too you know, uh, whatever. A lot of people should liked it, uh, but then in the end, they, they never really went on with it. I, I don't know why, but because the German book is actually almost sold out and, and it was very well received, if I can say this myself. And uh, yeah, so, but I thought for my students and also for, generally for the public yeah, because i was asked to uh, to translate it i just did it and then i published it myself oh, pretty good i love yeah. the um, the visuals as well so yeah they, they come from the, the design agency yeah yeah but it's yeah but it's it's really cool it, it makes it yeah. uh, very um accessible so uh so you can kind of um all the you know, the way the models are are designed and uh, no I, I really love it i what what surprised me was uh, because you, um you know, if you write a book, I you know it takes a while to write a book and then translate it. So what surprised me was actually the kind of the that it uh, started uh, with uh, you know the whole COVID nineteen uh, uh, a crisis, which yeah. is uh, which I thought, what? How new is this book? Like how when did you start? <laughs> it did is you, new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know, but you adapted it. Uh, that's nice because it's uh, because it makes it more. Well, because what you're saying basically is, uh, you know, if there's any time, uh, you know, to kind of consider, you know, be, you know leading design and, and mm -hmm. uh, managing design and, and doing it well, it's now. There is there yes. is no other. So it all of a sudden becomes a very topical book. Uh, but when you say, well, I started, you know, thinking about this, uh, you know, a very long time ago. Do you do you, do you think that what you you know you, you know what you're writing in the book um, is more re relevant now than ever? it becomes more and more relevant. And, and what I really like is that a a guy from a company that has no direct relationship to design or designers, he, he phoned me up, he, he he read my book, German book, the German version, which doesn't have the, the COVID chapter in it no, because yeah. it was before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it came yeah. up before COVID in 2018. Yeah. And he, he said, look, he said, I realized that I totally misunderstood what design can do in a company. I always thought of design as being this thing that you apply at the end of the of the value chain. You, 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 you make things, you know, look nice. You make a brochure, make this, make that, give a form, you know, to whatever has been conceived earlier on. Mm -hmm. And now I realize design 
is something that is e as important as management. Mm -hmm. I, I what, and I think this more and more people will realize this now, because what we see is how also our, our our societies are dealing with this problem is not different from dealing with a problem in a business organization huh? and problems you if you, you, there are two ways to, or many ways to go about problems you can eliminate them by just you know doing away with them or you can solve them yeah. and if you want to solve problem problems you need to have a design approach in it Because solving problems means understanding the problem from uh, another perspective. It's not about doing it away eh, or eliminating it, but really looking at who's inflicted, inflicted by all of this. Mm -hmm. What are the stakeholders' view to this? So you're going into the so-called, yeah, well, this the kind of design thinking approach where you, th you think in terms of options and solutions. And for not, in order for, for an organization to be able to do that, you have to have have design, you have to embrace design, not only in a form of form giving of artistic mm -hmm. articulation, but also mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, giving form to your thinking process and allowing exactly. different views, et cetera, et cetera. To yeah. Come in. So, uh, yeah. So because I, I like that design being part. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's your design thinking design. Thinking. I, I might not agree totally with this idea of design thinking is all about thinking. because I, that never had to me is like, no, yeah, I know it's in the word, but that's not what it was at, at all. It was about doing everything. It's anyway, we, we will skip that. because I, that's think why we, I have these three, I, I have to cut the, the, the ladder of the three. I know it's, it's, it's just my, it's just my little like, no, it's not. No, but I know, I know. I think we agree on all that, all of that anyway. So, but uh, design being, I like that. I like, I thought, oh, design being, that makes, you know, that feels right. But, um, but kind of to go to the kind of the current situation with this crisis mm -hmm. and it being more relevant than ever. So what I kind of like was this, um, this uh, you kind of have this visual, well, nobody can see it, but it's the design slide. So yeah, yeah. if you if you go because yeah because but no but it's so relevant when you're saying at least it's my fear it's my fear that you can take this crisis two ways you can say so because of this you what you're saying here you know the the, the misleading fact about the, the design material model is the notion that as soon as you have climbed a step you also have secure a secure hold you know that that's where you're going to stay but actually mm -hmm. you know at your design slide. I know how it's visualized, but but I but I think we all have experienced that in the past as well, where it's the first to go. Designing is like you know because I, I remember working at a, a at a, a corporate where they talked about the indirect people. Hmm. You had direct people; they make money directly with what they do, and then you have the indirect people, and they don't make money directly like commun internal communication people and stuff. People like those, right? So who are the first to go? The people who don't make money directly, which is I, to me is like a total you know, misunderstanding of, of the complexity of an organization and why it's successful. But design can be, you know, all the UX people that have been hired, uh, you know, all the, all, the, all the design that is kind of uh, put in place in the, these organizations. There's a risk that a crisis like this can say, you know, it's about, uh, you know, again, the shareholder value model says, you know, <laughs> everything that doesn't make us money directly, uh, you know, put it away. Innovation is similar. Um, I, I worked, uh, we did a big project for a company uh, in Germany and uh, uh, um, they, they called their uh, innovation departments, uh, their uh, submarines. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, because they had to be hidden because, all, because if they would know, you know, because the business would say, you're just burning money. You know, these people mm -hmm. don't know what they're doing. Just like, you know, they're just playing. What, what are they, you know, they have no clue. They're just experimenting. Everything goes wrong there, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So the, 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 you know, if you look at, you know, if, if, so the, the, the risk, that's my fear, like mm -hmm. this moment in time can kind of, uh, you know, it's a, your slide, can kind of produce that slide mm -hmm. yeah. what do you, or what's your feeling? Yeah, absolutely. That's and this is what I experienced myself, hands on, even before the crisis. Mm -hmm. That that, and I totally subscribe what you're saying. If you view design as something that is an added function to your organization, done by indirect or whoever, a supplier, yeah. an yeah. internal design team, yeah. if you consider design to be peripheral and not core to your business, mm -hmm. you're working on a design slide. 
and I think the um, this is also where where when I discuss with with people in leading leadership positions uh, as they call them, uh, so decide, deciding people in organizations, which often are managers, isn't it? They they have this management background; it, yeah. it brings them there. Um, and if I if I say you know if if you if you if you're okay with that, yeah, fine. You can use design, but you will it will slide away from you when it's getting more important. Exactly. Now and now in the crisis, um, I think companies will come out of the crisis more successful if they have access to their design capability on all the levels of the organization. If it's not a slide but a stepped model, uh, if it's secured. Yeah. So if you are considering what to do away because you have to save money, uh, let's say in these days. Eh? Mm-hmm. So how are you going to decide how to focus your portfolio or to reduce your expenses? I think it's crucial. If you do this with a, with a manager's perspective, you will count numbers and you will have a rational approach to that decision-making and you will reduce exposure, you will reduce risk and you will go for the safe option because that's what managers do that's that's in their whole dna well it could very well be that you cut away the important stuff that you will need to be relevant for customers when they come back after the crisis because in in a management decision there is no imagination of what it could be if you would continue with one or the other option so if designers will make their are making their decisions uh, which what I call without design being, so without an idea or of a, a competence, an ability to imagine what the decision will mean in the future, if the, if they if they are not able to do it in this way, they will throw away stuff which is essential. Right. I, I have this analogy also in my book. It's like you know that balloon. You know, you know. Oh shit! You know, we have to go over that mountain. There's this crisis. You know, you have to. Sh- Shed ballast. You, know, you have to throw away stuff. And managers often throw away their gas bottles. They, they throw away the stuff that will bring traction. You know, because they don't. They have no. They have no oversight. They have no imagination what in future eventually will bring um, uh, traction to the business. And here I, I clearly, from my from my observation over overlooking various companies. I see those companies and organizations can also be nonprofits make a difference if they have if they have this this the the competency of design not only with designers uh, which are the ones that are uh, I call them are are part of the design doing activity mm-hmm. of an organization uh, so if they don't have that competency not only there but if they have it everywhere in the organization so also in the processes and how how to run the business if they are have design competency in there and also in the strategy very much there so which is this this design being level as i describe it actually the letter is a as a borrowed model from the, the so called danish design letter which is a step model it's like right. you know a maturity model yeah but actually i think if i would redraw it i would put design being at the bottom I think it's the fundament of an organization. Ah, it's, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's like, for me, and maybe maybe an iceberg is a good analogy. Mm-hmm. It's at way at the bottom of the iceberg. The design being is the yeah. thing that nobody sees. Yeah. It's tucked away in darkness. Yeah. But if it's not there, yeah. the design doing will not stick out of the water. Yeah, exactly. You know, I like will, that. That's a that's a nice uh, image. Yeah. Because it, you, yeah, so you, the, yeah, because the way we use iceberg models often at the bottom is the mental model is where mm-hmm. where it actually, you know, it and the mental model is actually what kind of creates uh, systems and uh, and in the end, you know, all the kind of the events that you're seeing, although the, the those are just kind of those are uh, temporarily, but then there's, you know, they're supporting systems underneath, uh, mm-hmm. and yeah. and it's this this mental model, so which is basically it's a lot deeper, and that's where your design being is because uh, it is not just what you do it's not just because you know it's it is a, where does it come from so mm-hmm. i yeah that's really interesting i like that uh, um, but i um um 
think I, I have an iceberg model. Yeah, I do have yeah. an iceberg model. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course you have. I was all, thinking a, you're thinking you're like, wait iceberg. a minute, where's my Damn iceberg it. model? Which page is that iceberg? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Of course, page 151. <laughs> 151. Yeah, is the iceberg yeah, model. But, uh, yeah, no, you exactly. So, uh, but um, the the point being that it is, uh, and it, you you mentioned that word earlier. Uh, it's, it's you have to kind of think about these things holistically as well, um, mm -hmm. which is always scary for managers because that mm -hmm. sounds complex and big and expensive and yeah. and and but i think we're moving towards a time where companies who and you know it's it, it's not like uh you know there's going to be companies going to like big corporates uh that maybe in our mind are doing things all wrong are not just going to disappear but i think there's an opportunity for companies who do things differently i think there's an opportunity for companies who think about uh you know what you're calling design being but also mm -hmm. about you know um, long term not just shareholder value, but why are we doing these things? And then where, yeah. you know, um, where you, you know, you, you are connected to, you stay connected to your roots instead of you're forgetting about them and you build a whole business, you know, community around this kind of startup like Philips, for instance, like, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you forget where you came from and, and, and you find where you, where you came from, actually the scary bit. Because yeah, that's yeah. that's where you were entrepreneurs and where you tried stuff and you're like, hey, you know, this is cool. Let's go and and invent something. And uh, and uh, but the, yeah, I think companies who can understand that balance and find that balance, and I think that's what we see. I think companies who are in balance with both of these kind of aspects, they do, they're doing well, and and yes. companies are not they're not doing well. Uh, exactly. The the, the balance uh, is, is another thing that is is uh, yeah. <laughs> On no, page. Don't, I don't have it. <laughs> not on page something. It's in my well, German version. I took it out in the English one because I actually I didn't pick it up in the book. But I have this Venn diagram, and and this is supposed to show, you know, a good har a harmony of design and management yeah. in a company. And uh, and I think this is exactly the, the issue. What you just say, it's about the right balance. If we look how companies are run or organizations, also nonprofits, also our states, and specifically now in the current crisis, we, we can exactly observe the issue with a disbalance. If you are approaching a problem over, over dominantly from the perspective of management, you want to get rid of the problem. That's yeah. what we currently are doing. Uh, we, we approach the problem like, okay, get rid of it. You know, Now, in back into a company, I think, well, resilient companies for me are those that are able to balance the design skills or a comp a competency on an equal level with the management comp uh, competencies. Right. Because with, with the management competencies, they're able to control and secure the resources and make sure that everything is running in, let's say, well-managed, well-organized ways. And with the design, they're making sense of what they do they create propositions that are relevant to customers uh, and they're also able to with that to differentiate themselves from competitors so as a business leader or leadership leadership for me is the ability to do exactly that to balance between management and design and and not saying it's either or but saying it's both i mean if you if you say okay guys let's go and go there you know and we have a vision and this is why customers need us this is what we produce this is this is all design stuff huh? you cannot manage your future you can only design it huh? so if you say this is our future this is where we go and you do that without then taking care of the organization and making sure the the ambition is in line with the resources and, and you know balance that out you don't have leadership you own. If you're only looking at design, you have a, a visionary or a missionary. You have somebody, you know, <laughs> screaming like, oh, this is where we need to go. And on the contrary, if you only have a manager, that person will say, well, let's all remain where we are. Let's, let's secure everything we have. Let's throw away what we don't need. Leadership is about exactly combining the two. And, 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 being a and if you're able to do that, you're going into a sustainable future because you don't waste your resources, but at the same time, you are meaningful and relevant to society or to customers. 
Yeah. So, and then, you know, going now to the business faculty, I want to, and I did that because I want to discover how are these business people educated? What's on, on their, you know, curriculum? What is a, uh, a business manager education? What's an MBA all about? And the name already says it. It's an MBA. It's a Master of Business Administration. And, and it's not a Master of Business Design. Hmm. So I think that's already where you can see we have the wrong focus. The focus is on administration, on security, on, ta on taking care. It's important, absolutely so, but only if it's balanced well with the master of business design. And these aspects of design are, are I think, growing also with the notion of design thinking and also with, yeah, with generally paying more attention now to design topics but it's by far not there yet. And then and I see a lot of companies that are dominated by management thinking, by MBAs, by people that go and think, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm a manager, then I'm a leader. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> if you're a manager, you're half a leader. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you're a designer, maybe, maybe also. Yeah. But if yeah. you're able to combine both, yeah, then you're a leader exactly. because then you're able to, as well, you know, manage and design at the same time. So cool. that's basically what I what I try to uh, to follow up on. Exactly. Thank you. We've. Uh, I think it's a good place to end. Um, we've talked for a while. I think we can talk more. Yeah, of course. But <laughs> well, thank you, Arne. It's uh, yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, I like I like the fact that um, you you know my 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 sense is the of this conversation is that you are. You're an outsider um, in 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 a good way because it it makes you re uh, recognize the bubble that you're that you're in uh, currently, and mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need more people like you because you are the bridge. You can bridge all these bubbles, and it and it a lot. It, so you need to be a little bit of an outsider everywhere, really, uh, because it means that you can connect to all these different bubbles, and you can, you know, you might not be, you know, totally fully part of that bubble but it does mean that you you are the you can be the bridge between all these bubbles and i think that's that's such a uh you know so it's it's always so cool to hear that because i really believe in that we need those people and and it's so interesting to hear that you know there's people like you there and you are doing that you are you are doing that at the, mm -hmm. you've always been doing that it's also part of your upbringing and you know the, you know the, that's that's who you are it's not you know it's not a role it's not what you play you are that you know that's just the way you are and i and i think there's there's more people and i think it would be good to recognize people like like yourself and there's more of them that they they can have a very important role in the future in in, in the future in, in the businesses and in societies governments and everywhere you know and i think we need to have uh the guts to to have to give these people a, a place where they can be of importance and if influence and uh, and uh, but it takes courage because it takes courage to, to bring someone in who's from outside of your bubble. Yeah. So, um, but uh, so that's 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 really cool to hear. So to have to see you as a, uh, I think that's true leadership to be able to kind of go into a bubble and uh, and, and try to understand it and try to blend in, but never not be yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.